the when the Iranian Revolution came or happened or erupted, uh, there were many books about trying to explain what the why the revolution. And of course, for many people, it was surprised because here you had the regime that seemed solid, a huge army, a huge navy, a huge air force, huge bureaucracy, huge oil revenues, huge amount of socioeconomic modern, so-called modernization. So on paper, it looked like a solid uh, firm establishment, like some of the huge dams that were built. And very few people accepted this system to crumble. Yet it crumbled very quickly. After a few months of demonstrations, it was a spectacular collapse. And then the question become, how did it happen? So laying aside the conspiratorial theories about, you know, the Western wanted the Shah out, we are left with the question, why this revolution? And um, much of the writing on explanation of the revolution was done actually very quickly during and after the revolution. It was done predominantly by political scientists, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, uh, not by historians, because historians want basically documents, archives and stuff. So it's not until I think much, much more recently, the 21st century, that one can go back and look at the archives to see what was happening to explain why this system crumbled so spectacularly in 78, 79. And when you look back, what you, I think, uh, strikes one is how uh, fragile the Shah state was throughout the period. So you, you look at the uh, British American documents, sure, they all like the Shah, they consider him basically their best friend in the world, is doing all the right things and so on. But in their memos, invariably, you, there is some line where the writer of the report is savvy enough to put a warning there saying, yes, the regime is looks good, is, uh, looks uh, solid, uh, but there are warnings, there are clouds, dark clouds in the sky. Uh, so to give you one example, in the big celebrations, the Persepolis celebrations, the British ambassador talks about, you know, this pomp and ceremony, and it's very flattering. But at the end, he warns that this pomp and ceremony is basically is not a sign of strength. It's a sign of fragility of the regime. And the Shah is trying to cover up the fragility of the regime by having these ceremonies and appearing in the line of 2,500 year monarchy. So a lot of the, the if you read the fine print in uh, these dispatches from the embassies, there is always a warning. Of course, they can't talk about what is the reason for the regime's basically weakness. They often say, well, the Shah has too much power. But uh, what I think they're really touching on is the lack of legitimacy the regime has. And this goes back to 53. That in 53, here you had a national hero, Mossad, there, who had obtained national independence for the country was overthrown by the uh, by the foreign powers not only overthrown but the person who replaced him the shah was really the puppet the man of the west so this brought the shah basically from the beginning the original sin of the new regime was the 53 coup the lack of legitimacy and here, actually, the Shah is quite perceptive, much more perceptive than pop people uh, allow. Because if during the whole oil crisis, the Shah was always adamant in talking privately to the British and the Americans, saying, I can't afford to go against Mossad there in oil nationalization, because if I do so, I will undermine discredit uh, myself and the monarchy. So he knew even in 51, 
that if he went against oil nationalization in Mossad there, he would be actually undermining the monarchy. And he was dragged into the coup, actually, by the CIA. Uh, he, he was not an eager participant in the coup. Uh, he was given an ultimatum, uh, ultimately, by the CIA, that if he didn't participate in the coup, uh, one of his brothers would replace him after the coup. So the, uh, that he had no choice. It was <laughs> an offer he couldn't refuse. He had to accept. But he knew that from beginning. And consequently, after 53, he did his best to try to get legitimacy, to replace the loss of legitimacy. And so he did these type of political acrobatics, uh, which he hoped would get him uh, legitimacy, but in fact didn't do that. So it further undermined him. Uh, one acrobatics was what I just mentioned was the OPEC grandstanding. Another acrobatic was, of course, the white revolution. Here he argued that he was more revolutionary than other revolutionaries because he was taking land away from the landlords and giving it to the peasants. So he was basically the people, the shahs, the people of the shah, uh, the shahs of the uh, people, and therefore he uh, was going to be uh, accepted popular because of uh, redistribution of land. And of course, that further undermined him because it destroyed his link with the traditional ruling class, the landed class, and elements of the clerical hierarchy. Another acrobatics he did was, of course, the Persepolis and this whole thing about 2,500 year history of monarchy. And this was trying to tap into national sentiment, but it further alienated, I would say, the uh, clerical hierarchy, because it, from their point of view, this was a way of undermining uh, Shi'ism. Um, and therefore, the Shi'i clerics who in 53 had been either neutral or supportive of the Darbar, by the, the 78, 79, were in the opposition and were siding with Khomeini. So this, uh, another, of course, uh, sort of acrobatics he did was to appear, try to appear more nationalistic than Mossad there by building up a huge military, uh, appearing that he was the big strong man of the region. And this further undermined him because it reinforced the view that he was the puppet of the West because he had appointed himself the gendarmerie of the West in the, in the Persian Gulf, and that all this money that was going into military was in fact wasted money that should have gone into uh, social economic development. So all these efforts to get legitimacy because of lack of legitimacy further undermined the situation and so when the crisis came, well, it was a minor crisis. I mean, it's a, a small dip in oil revenues in, uh, in uh, 77, 78. Uh, it was not a huge decline in oil revenues, but a very small dip. And Iran still had huge reserves abroad. So there was no economic crisis at that time. But a slight dip and a small, slight pressure from Western both press and governments about human rights, that was enough to sort of really unravel the system because the system itself was fragile. So there is actually a very interesting comment from the American embassy at, uh, in 78 saying the Shah can't really negotiate with anyone in the opposition because no one in the opposition considers him legitimate. So you really can't negotiate, uh, sit down and say, well, well, you know, well, I'll bargain if the other side really doesn't even consider your, uh, your any power you have as legitimate power. So I think the question of legitimacy, I think, explains or lack of legitimacy explains the revolution uh, rather than other issues that have been brought up to in the sociological or anthropological explanations for the revolution. In a way, what I hear you are saying, and putting it around the issue of legitimacy, is that 
it connects it to the the coup. In other words, the sort of desire for national sovereignty, which as a result of the the coup was um, stopped or unfinished, was a political desire that in one way or another uh, continued. This was troubling for the Shah. And Shah, in fact, was, one can argue, more successful in undermining more secular political forces, including National Front, because I'm hearing that you are saying, and it seems, of course, correct, that Shah was somehow aware of this issue. However, he could never ever genuinely, if you want to call it Iranian nationalism, or become a symbol of Iranian sovereignty. So now, the question I have, you may agree or disagree with this, but my understanding is that that one major attempt Shah made in the 60s, but certainly in the 70s, to achieve certain level of legitimacy was a embrace, embrace of some kind of Iranian Islam uh, that we see in his speeches. He has this very interesting speech that he gave at Harvard. He that initiative that he presented to UN and new institution that he, he created, including actually some of the events in Shiraz festival and presenting himself as a moral, almost a prophetic figure, which he must have hoped that would bring a, a sort of different way of achieving legitimacy. Uh, but of course, the, the religious forces and certainly the cler Shia clerics were already there. They were, they opposed him and the secular forces were in a substantial way undermined and he, he lost that battle. In addition to that, and this is not in the context of oil necessarily, there are evidence to show that in the 70s, certainly later in the 70s, Shah seemed to develop a, a more hostile attitude, say, toward Israel, toward the US and the West in, in general. And it wasn't just the Shah. There were, uh, say, Iranian national TV had several programs, and some of them went for years, really center, centered on critique of Western liberalism and Western culture. Of course, when I say more hostile or critical, these are all in terms of ideological or cultural critique of the West. The notion of Qar Zadiki was, it was very common for, um, for institutions, cultural institutions related or funded by Darbar and by government to, to circulate this whole idea of Qar Zadiki as something that is alien to Iranian say, national identity, uh, including some pro Pahlavi journals, but certainly Iranian national, uh, uh, national Iranian TV and radio uh, programmings. Do you see at all as a sign of him being desperate in achieving legitimacy and then backlashing? Well, I would see those measures, uh, again, trying to get legitimacy, that, that using the same language as the opposition, like Rav Zadigi, saying, you know, I'm as anti-West as uh, you are, I'm as revolutionary as you are, I'm actually more radical than Mossad there because I'm achieving all these things, Mossad. The thing is, I think this actually compounded the problem because because hovering over behind over this is, of course, the memory of 53. These people knew about 53. So when someone um, uses this language that they're anti-West, the obvious question then comes is if you're anti-West, how come the West brought you to power? So it becomes a question, it, it compounds the problem because it makes 
the regime basically vulnerable to the charge of hypocrisy, basically of uh, masquerading that there's something they're not. Uh, and I think that further undermines the system so because the system then becomes the butt of humor, butt of satire. So if you look at the demonstrations, so much of it was slogans making fun of the regime because the regime is seen as basically phony because what is uh, what it says, uh, what it does on its television or journals doesn't conform to the reality of 53 of what had happened. Um, so in that way, it actually, I think, uh, further undermined the system rather than strengthened it. And what the regime was trying to, I would say, desperately trying to uh, use the language, the discourse of the opposition as if it was its own discourse. So I can give you one example. I know someone in who was in Evin when uh, human rights organizations came to prison to talk to uh, prisoners. Uh, the prison wardens would tell the prisoners, don't talk to these guys from the West. They're part of the Western imperialism. <laughs> Anything you say will basically strengthen Western imperialism. As a good nationalist, you should refuse to talk to anyone from human rights organizations or from the Red Cross or whatever. Uh, so obviously the prisoners <laughs> uh, were not going to be fooled by this type of uh, uh, of double talk or masquerading. Uh, so I think the, uh, of course, at that time, people saw this as basically masquerading. And when you look at the documents uh, now, uh, it wasn't their misconception. Actually, most of this masquerading was masquerading. So at the time when uh, the journals in Iran were talking about, you know, uh, racism in Africa, supporting uh, African liberation, the Shah was actually secretly funding uh, South African campaigns to destabilize and de destroy former uh, Portuguese colonies. Uh, so they were basically siding with the apartheid government in South Africa while at the same time, uh, Princess Ashraf was a chairwoman of the Committee on uh, Anti-Racism. <laughs> so what could be more hypocritical than that? So the public image uh, accusation of hypocrisy was actually quite realistic. In your book, Mujahideen, this is not about Mujahideen, I think in the earlier a chapter or two, you give a sort of theoretical explanation, explanation of fragility of Shah's state, pre-revolutionary state, that I feel is not very long, is 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 very thoughtful and very convincing. Do you want to remind us of your argument there, which I, it's not in conflict what you said, but you don't focus on legitimacy; you focus on structural issues. One question. The other question that probably wrong, uh, raises a question about whether this weakness of the state was, was seen at the time is that the first book I read a little after the revolution was Fred Holliday's book, Dictatorship and Development. Uh, it's unfortunate that the book was written before revolution, but he had to mention something about revolution. But in the book, Fred Holliday very adamantly argues that the regime is so strong, there is no way that it would be overthrown or would collapse or anything in the near future. Of course, the irony is that the book was published when the regime was gone. How do you explain this? Or the first question first, do you want to say something briefly about your analysis in that in Mujahideen's book. Yeah, I, I mean, in Mujahideen, also in uh, Iran between two revolutions, I tried to explain the revolution in terms of uh, structural weaknesses and how basically there was some socioeconomic modernization but lack of political modernization at the top. But looking back now, you know, a couple of decades later, you look back, 
you still left with the question that even if there was structural problems, um, there are plenty of states that have structural problems but don't collapse. So the question is why this regime collapsed so quickly? And there I, I'm basically uh, finding what I didn't look at before was the question of legitimacy. Sorry. So uh, now looking back, looking at the stuff, same materials that uh, re-looking at them, I, I'm finding the question of legitimacy becomes very important, which I, I would know in, in the 19, 1980s, right after the revolution, I didn't really think that that was that issue, mainly because none of the secondary sources had ever really brought that issue up. It was much more when you look at the confidential reports uh, written after 53 that this issue comes, I think, is implicitly there. So another, I mean, related issue is when the opposite, the crisis starts in 77 in Iran, 1977, you know, generally what Fred and others thought was this regime is so big, so solid, so has so much going for it that it can always basically moderate, give concessions, uh, liberalize, and therefore the regime itself is not threatened. It could, and that's the what was the thinking of the State Department, of the Foreign Office, of uh, people, uh, most analysts, not just even Fred, but people like James Bill, uh, Zonis, they thought this regime was quite capable of reform. And because it could afford the reform, it should reform and do that. The problem what they were not taking into account is the question of lack of legitimacy, because uh, you could tell the Shah, you know, you're so powerful, you can afford to not torture his prisoners. Uh, but he knew that once he started uh, reforms, uh, there was no end to it because the, the opposition, the public really didn't consider him legitimate. They could always demand more, and he would have then give more concessions. So I think he was there savvy enough to resist and actually be cautious about reform, because he knew the question of legitimacy was there. And even people in Iran, older politicians like Sanjabi, Bazargan, they were thinking of that the regime, again, is so solid, you can uh, bargain with it, get it to get concessions, and everything could go gradually, step by step. It's interesting that the, the advisors to Khomeini in exile uh, were not these old-time politicians who had been living under the, the sort of huge uh, dams, formidable dams, they were all products of 53 student movement. And for them, the whole thing was illegitimate. It was a paper tiger. All you had to do is continue blowing at it and it would crumble like a pack of cards. So the people such as Yazdi, Port Bizardeh, Chamron, they're all basically uh, survivors of the student movement of 53. They were the victims of 53 coup. They saw the regime as basically a puppet regime. And despite all the arms and stuff, they were convinced that if you could just continue opposing, the system would collapse. So they were the main advisors to Khomeini in Paris <laughs> saying, don't compromise. Basically, the Shah must go, the Shah must go. And if you continue saying that, the Shah will collapse. So here again, I think 53, the shadow or the uh, the dangers of 53, the memory of 53 is very much operative in 78, 79. Interesting. So do you think this revisionist history of the coup is partly part of this larger industry of a narrative to achieve the legitimacy by basically comparing Mossadegh to Khomeini by raising legal and 
really legitimacy of of Mossadegh's actions uh, to sort of rewrite history in a way that sort of Pahlavi state would gain certain political legitimacy, or is it just a desperate attempt to rewrite history? Well, I think nowadays, I mean, the, the new regime after 79 came with a great deal of legitimacy. The legitimacy was really based on the revolution itself, that here you had unprecedented mass participation in a popular revolution. So didn't lack any problems with legitimacy. Over the years, it's lost a lot of legitimacy, not totally, but clearly it doesn't have 80, 90% support that it had in 79 or 80. It may have 9, 15 or 20 percent support. So it, it's for various reasons, it's it's basically eroded its legitimacy. But one way it I think tries to get legitimacy is by uh, going back, harping back on the coup, saying here the West uh, is very dangerous. It carried out the coup in 53. And it wants to do the same thing. So we have to be on alert. We have to distrust the West because the West is uh, always the West. If that it did this in 53, it wants to do the same now. And this was, of course, the uh, explicit reason for this hostage crisis of uh, American hostage crisis. And the trouble with that is its misuse of history uh, of because no two situations are the same. It's a very different situation now. In 53, the US had the structure, the organization, the uh, allies inside the country to carry out a coup. Uh, by 1980, the US did not have that. US just did not have the capability. I'm not saying it didn't wish to remove the regime. It, even if it wanted to, it could have contingency plans. But the only way it could carry out a coup was by a military occupation of the country. And this it was, wasn't willing to do. So I think the regime it was basically misusing 50, memory of 53 to try to get support or anti-Western feelings in in the contemporary situation uh, and it's i think there's an interesting contrast between uh vietnam and iran once the vietnamese war ended the us pulled out the vietnamese took saigon the vietnamese were then quite happy to normalize relations with united states uh, they knew the United States was in no position to try and bring back the generals. But, so they realistically, they were willing to normalize. It was the Americans who couldn't get over, overcome the Vietnam syndromes, who delayed normalizing. But in Iran, unlike the Vietnam, is the Khomeini regime uh, tried to latch on to 53 and the coup as a way of trying to rally support, not necessarily in support of the regime, but against uh, against United States, against the West. So again, uh, one and one when one uses history, one has to be careful whether there are actually similarities or dissimilarities between two different situations. <laughs>